First, I'll tell you something about my dad. Um, he didn't follow uh, what his d dad did. Uh, my grandfather was a conductor for the MK and T Railroad, but my dad didn't follow that. He was a mechanic uh, and worked at the Myers Motor Company in downtown Oklahoma City, and he got his craw full of of working in the in that kind of a routine and decided to break away into uh, the oil business. But let me tell you something about my mother too. Uh, uh, he met my mother, they, they both were in Tecumseh, Oklahoma and Shawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, he uh, used to drive an old car down to, to woo my mother. <laughs> Uh, in Tecumseh and uh, would bring her up to Oklahoma City and lo and behold, take her down to the, uh, the little place called Belle Isle. Well, Belle Isle was a little uh, fun place to be because it had boats that you could rent for the water. It had a little uh, uh, Ferris wheel and some other things that uh, that were fun for people to do. It had a lovely pavilion for uh, a dance band, and on the weekends, they always had a, a large uh, dance band playing uh, the current music. But my dad wooed my mother by renting one of these boats, and he took her out. Uh, that's that's main sea corner, uh, out on the, uh, the water, and they rowed around, and Pretty soon he, he picked up his ukulele. Now I don't know how my dad ever learned how to play a ukulele, but he, he uh, played the ukulele and wooed my mother and asked her to be his wife. And I thought that was so sweet uh, to remember something as dear as Belle Isle and my parents being down there and all of a sudden, if you look, you'll see that that's only two blocks from where I'm living right now with my wife, Betty, our corner. And uh, it's, it's kind of unique that everything has happened in that area. But anyway, that's kind of a story about my parents. Uh, we had a, a rather large family uh, scattered all over the place. We had a we have a Dr. Dick Wilkins, uh, Williams that's uh, located in Tulsa, and he's a, a general practitioner doctor. Uh, there are other people that, uh, I had four old maid aunts that all had different kinds of businesses that were interesting. One of them uh, had a dress shop. One of them worked, as, worked for the county clerk, and uh, I can't tell you what the other two did, but they all had jobs and they all lived in Tecumseh, Oklahoma. Uh, Tecumseh, Oklahoma, I think probably had a hundred people living there at the time. It was an awful place to go uh, as a child to spend, uh, to spend two weeks in the summer because there wasn't anything to do. There was one movie house and they played the same show for a full week before they changed it. So anyway, that gives you a little background about my parents. I'm Richard C. Corner, and uh, I'm sitting here in a chair to try to tell you a little something about my life, and I hope that it'll be interesting and short, but it probably won't. <laughs> so, so let's begin about 1936 uh, when we moved uh, from uh, just a couple of blocks from where we live right now on 46th Street, Northwest 46th and Classen and uh, we moved over to the east side of town where the uh, OU complex is now. They tore down all of those buildings in that area. And uh, before they did, we lived there. And uh, we lived on a second story of a building. And uh, I heard things through the radio 
And I said, you know, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to uh, to put my voice through the through the radio. I wonder how I can do that. So I had a headphone. And why I had a headphone, I'll I'll never know. But I went into the back of the the. Uh, uh, radio phonograph that we had and uh, began to touch a couple of bare wires to different things. Well, I got shocked terribly a couple of times, but I finally got on the top of a tube and a ground wire and all of a sudden, voila, I could hear myself through the radio voice, through, through the speaker. And that just whet my appetite to do something. Uh, through that radio. So uh, moving along, and we'll try to make this short as possible, we moved to Edmond, and uh, I began to do a lot more things with, with the microphone, uh, which turned out to be an earphone, really. That's all a, a microphone is, is an earphone, except it's better and built differently. But Anyway, the, uh, the gist of that was I began to talk through the radio and then I wanted to be able to play music. Uh, 78 records, we had, we had a pretty nice collection of music and uh, uh, some way or another I fooled around and I got the, the phonograph to play through it along and I could talk over the top of the records. Well, without a today's modern boards or anything, I was talking and playing music through the radio when I was 11 years old. And all of this just kept building through the years, you know, and, and uh, I was in grade school at, at uh, Clagern and junior high school in Edmond and two years at uh, uh, the high school there and I began to play the piano for a lot of affairs, the school affairs, the dances and things and we formed a little four-piece band called the Teen Town Tutors. Uh, I can't uh, exactly remember the bass player but I do know that we had a saxophone with uh, uh, J.C. O'Rourke and we had a trumpet with uh, Doyce Adamson. I played the piano and we had a bass uh, player and then we had a drummer. We had a five piece band instead of four. I just forgot. Okay, that, uh, that also whets your appetite to, uh, to hear yourself. And my dad had bought a recording machine with uh, with the radio phonograph that we had, so we could make uh, we could make records at my house. So we would put the band in my house on Littler, 715 South Littler, and play and make records. But we didn't make many, but and they were glass based and they broke all the time because of the war, which I'll bring in later. Uh, so uh, let's go back just a little bit. Uh, when we moved to Edmond, I, I went to grade school. That would be uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth and fifth grade, I believe. Uh, the, then I went to junior high school, which would be six and seven, and then two years, eight and nine, for uh, the high school. Now, the high school is where the band got started. and. Uh, uh, I, had a, I had quite a following of, of young ladies, by the way. I had usually, when I went home, uh, three or four of those giggly ladies were following me. They came home to hear me play the piano. Now that's kind of bragging, I think, and I shouldn't do that, perhaps. So we've, um, we've gotten ourselves along. Uh, pretty well and in the process, you know, I left out one important thing. Uh, early on, before I could talk through the radio, I did rig up two tin cans and a string. And I had my mother at one end of the string with a can, 
and I have the other one, and we try to talk to each other through uh, 210K, and as you will see now in uh, the uh, Progresso uh, commercials for uh, soup that they're advertising on the television now. So anyway, let's get back to our story. Uh, my dad uh, was a carpenter, uh, besides being an oil and gas leaseman, and very successful at that. So about two or three blocks away from where we were living, we decided to build a new home. And we started it, we had the house pretty well put together, the tar paper on the outside, and we were working there that Sunday afternoon, December 7th, and uh, somebody came up and told us that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And in the process of that, uh, we couldn't finish the house. The War Production Board uh, stopped all construction and started issuing building permits. And those building permits were not allowed in Edmond. Edmond was 2,500 people when I lived there. Very small, little bedroom community. Uh, but uh, we, we uh, decided that uh, perhaps Oklahoma City might be a place we could build a house. So we decided to tear down the house on Elm, which is, eight, I think it was about 800 Elm. And uh, we tore the house down. My dad taught me how to uh, take a board off of the, off of the building and uh, take the nails out of it. And prior to that, he had built a boat trailer. And every night we moved whatever lumber I had ready down to Oklahoma City uh, to build the house. And <clears throat> being innovative and my dad being such a fan of uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, he decided to build the first concrete slab house in Oklahoma City, which he did. And we took the house way up off the ground by about two or three feet so that there would never be a flood, but we were not in a flood area anyway. But anyway, we built our house, and that was along about 1942. And I enrolled then in high school, at Classen High School, which is 18th and Ellison. And I rode the interurban from Edmond to 17th and Classen every day to go to class. And then I would ride the interurban and go back to Edmond uh, every day and then help my dad on the weekends. And we built our house and we moved into it in 1943. In the process of this, uh, there wasn't a band anymore because that was in Edmond. And two of the players were drafted. And so they went to war and uh, I didn't. And this is going to be the part at uh, class in high school, uh, any time that they had a, uh, an event at class in high school, uh, they always had a dance afterwards. And many times they would uh, push in a piano and I would play for the, uh, the students to dance to. We had a great time. There was another great piano player that played too also and it was Richard Shreve. And uh, I know he probably went on to fame and fortune because he played so well. And of course they had a dance band also with uh, uh, Mr. Pitts. I don't know, they can't remember Mr. Pitts name, but they had a 16 piece dance orchestra that played also for those things. And uh, uh, I waited through high school and all the kids used to come out to our house uh, and my mother would, on Friday night, push all the furniture into another room in the house so that the kids could dance and none of them knew how to dance. So my mother taught most of them. They all danced with my mother and learned how to dance and we had great music, you know, and 
she fixed banana cream pie and she fixed hamburgers and we had we got the uh, the man down the street Williams uh, uh, store down there they would let you have six cokes a week is all you were allowed but he knew that we weren't doing anything wrong so he'd let us have a dozen so we had plenty of cokes for everybody and uh, then I tripped on down to OU to start to school and my dad wanted me to be uh, first he wanted me to be an architect so I studied under Mr. Brown uh, architecture uh, at Classen and I didn't like it and I, and I didn't do what I should do in it so uh, that one went by the board so my dad said well we're we're gonna get you in down to OU and you can be a geologist so I enrolled in the geology school and uh, didn't do too well with it because it wasn't long that I found out that I was uh, partially colored blind and uh, to be partially colored blind would not be a good thing to to have because you have to see the hues in rock like pinks and reds and things and those colors I didn't see well so I had a perfect opportunity to uh, say I couldn't be a geologist ha ha <laughs> so so I weaseled out of that deal uh, uh, quite by accident really because I enrolled in a course at OU, a two-hour course in, uh, in speech. And I perhaps was the first person to ever uh, bring a wire recorder to class with my project. I recorded my project on wire recording and presented it to the class, which was quite nice and the teacher, you know, blew her away. Um, and then I met Dr. Lawton at the, uh, at the school. It was next door to where we were having the speech classes. And uh, I enrolled in beginning uh, radio courses. That's where you write uh, a story and then you produce it. And you produce it, uh, uh, those things for radio. And uh, he thought I had a talent in that. So he gave me a letter that allowed me, even though I had only been in the school a year, to take any course that was on the curriculum at the university, whether I had the prerequisites or not. He, he said, you can enroll in anything you want, Richard. So it, quite, a, quite a wonderful, wonderful man, Dr. Sherman P. Lawton. And uh, I, I went, went along in the radio school and did quite well, and we built the first carrier current radio station in this part of the country. There were six of us uh, that built a radio station, and they gave us one of the production rooms so that we could play the records and, and they could have all this practice of, of broadcasting. We had a little broadcasting station. We sold advertising and we made $1,000 our first summer. We made a profit and we were thrilled. And a lot of people, a lot of people came to see our, our setup and even people from other, from other cities came to to see us because we were doing something quite unique. Now carrier current, perhaps I should explain that. Uh, carrier current rides on the outside uh, of a wire. So if you put, if you put a transmitter uh, in a coupling action uh, to a wire, it will run through like electric wires, telephone wires, uh, anything that has a copper wire in it. Uh, and it would become a way for people to listen to us on the radio at uh, 590 KUVY. Um, and this little station went on for years down at OU 
and finally turned into KGOU, which is now the National Public Radio Station. So those are some of the interesting things, but let's digress just a bit now for me. Uh, I had an opportunity, uh, Dr. Sherman P. Lawton decided that it would be good if I had some practical experience in real radio. So he helped me get a job in uh, Clovis, New Mexico, KCIA. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, a, I don't know, a thousand watt full-time uh, AM radio station. and. Uh, uh, I worked there for, I don't know, six months or something, uh, and we were involved in uh, being adjacent to the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, doing all of this uh, nuclear bomb experiments. Uh, they were, uh, you know, blowing up these bombs in Nevada, and my parents found out about it, and they got in the car and drove out and said, you're coming home. So I gave the guy, Mr. McAllister, and he was very sweet, uh, gave him one day's notice and left. And we came back home. I enrolled in uh, Oklahoma City University and picked out a curriculum of business uh, administration and economics and uh, went to school there. Uh, and graduated in 1952 with a bachelor's degree. And <laughs> my next step was I always wanted to be, and I know this sounds awful, or it doesn't sound awful either. It's, it's nice because I always wanted to be in the Navy. I always wanted to be on one of those big ships and be at sea and see the ocean and see countries and and meet people from, from all over the world. Well, I had that opportunity. I graduated from Oklahoma City University, as I may have told you earlier, in 1952 and joined the Navy. And after boot camp, which is three months, uh, I was assigned to a ship, the USS Leo, AKA 60. And it's unbelievable, but our first uh, assignment was to go to Anawetok Island uh, where we were going to uh, uh, test the first hydrogen bomb, the first one that had ever been uh, set off and it was at uh, Anawetok uh, Atoll. And uh, it was interesting because we were only 35 miles from the explosion and uh, we were given glasses to wear because it would, uh, uh, you know, blind us if we looked at it. And uh, it might be interesting to let you know that uh, most people didn't uh, think anything about the radiation aspects, uh, but I did because I had a Geiger counter and I took it by and we had uh, an outside bin that had potatoes in them and that we were eating lots of potatoes. And I ran the Geiger counter across the uh, potatoes and they were radioactive, uh, seven millirankins. Now, I don't know how many millirankins it takes to do damage to you, but uh, we ate a lot of potatoes down there. And not only that, uh, it's interesting to note that the next day they threw a lovely party for all of us on the sands of Anawetok Atoll where we swam and uh, had uh, steaks and uh, had a good time, but we were wallowing in the sand, which I'm sure was also radioactive. So it was kind of interesting to note that uh, this is something that I probably had forgotten to, to mention, but I think it is important. Um, after the uh, experience at Anawetok, 
uh, we came back to the United States and our next assignment was to go to Alaska. And we were in Alaska 92 days uh, resupplying uh, little places like Cape Hope and little places that are hardly even on the map because most of them were, uh, you know, Navy places that they didn't want people to know that they were there or what they were doing there. So they, they would have a, a group of Navy people there and we would take all kinds of supplies, food, uh, in some cases uh, uh, automobiles, uh, jeeps, uh, all kinds of things, uh, living uh, things like, uh, you know, you'd have to have uniforms, just about everything that you need uh, to subsist through the winter because uh, by the time it gets to be uh, late September, uh, the uh, waters begin to freeze over and you need to be out of there. We were, uh, we went way up into the, uh, the places, uh, one of them was called the Two Diomedes. One of them belonged to, to the United States, the other belonged to Russia, and there was a distance of three miles between the two. Uh, and that was a gingerly thing to uh, get up in there and take care of your uh, assignment and then get out. And so that pulled us back out of, uh, of Alaska and at, uh, at that time, we came back to Seattle, Washington, and uh, we were getting ready to, uh, to embark uh, on another assignment, and I got papers uh, uh, that day that assigned me to the Fleet Sonar School in San Diego. Uh, everybody wanted off of the ship. That's all I could think about was getting off of the ship. Uh, I didn't even think about it, and I got papers after 21 months on the USS Leo to go to um, the U.S. Fleet Sonar School. Well, there you uh, train people, uh, ships, and submarines for uh, anti-submarine warfare. And I worked around the corner from the captain, uh, I mean, not the captain, but the admiral for Com Traypack. And uh, uh, I worked for three lieutenant commanders that were all uh, submariners. And it was, a, it was an in interesting experiment. I wrote the, uh, uh, the uh, plan for the ships to practice their attacks on each other, what they call plaster loads. Uh, we had plaster loads for, for torpedoes and all kinds of things that wouldn't damage a ship, but uh, would give you uh, a point of reference. If you hit the side of a, of a destroyer, it would leave a big white mark so that you knew that, that the, <laughs> that the uh, that the torpedo had hit it. So anyway, uh, those are interesting things. I wrote the op plans for those, not, not really uh, in the sense of the word of writing them. Uh, they were written by other people, but I typed them up and uh, marked them confidential, and then they were, I took them over to uh, another building at Fleet Sonar School where they were sent out and distributed uh, to the people for the week that they'd be at sea. Before I left the Navy, one of the last things I did was uh, the, uh, the people in my office wanted me to ride a submarine. So they assigned me a half a day to a destroyer escort, which is surface vessel, and then I spent a half a day uh, on board a submarine and uh, it was quite an experience and they hoped to woo me into re-enlisting uh, in the Navy which I didn't do I came home instead. After riding the submarine and the destroyer escort uh, it was time to leave the Navy 
and I was uh, separated from the Navy and given my papers. Uh, and I was uh, out of the Navy and into the reserves, which is for eight years. I just spent four years active duty in the Navy. So I came home because my mother uh, had her sister uh, at the house and she was very ill. And I wanted to, to try to help mom and help my dad too with uh, taking care of her sister. Uh, but in the meantime, I needed a job. I needed to now finally decide, well, now what am I gonna do with my life? Now that I've gotten out of the Navy, I've seen part of the world. I traveled 200,000 miles on the USS Leo alone. I saw, I saw Japan, Korea, the Philippine Islands, Guam, uh, Alaska, so many places in Alaska. Uh, I, had a, I had quite an education uh, of seeing those things like that. So I'm back home and uh, nothing really to do except my dad said, well, I said, here you are, you have, a, you have the only person that's ever graduated from the university. And that was quite a feat and everybody was real happy about that. So I went with my dad. He, he had an office downtown on the Republic Building, which is uh, the old Braniff Building. And uh, I went to work for him and I got into geology in the aspects of the oil business in uh, leasing uh, uh, royalties and uh, mineral rights to uh, pieces of property. One of his first assignments, he worked for the City Service Oil Company and the Carter Oil Company as a land man. He bought uh, so many, many leases, hundreds of thousands of acres of leases. So he got the assignment to, uh, to uh, lease the town of Laverne for gas exploration. And so he gave me the job. He said, I'll pay you, I'll pay you very nicely if you will type these 5,000 uh, leases for me. And uh, I'll give you half of what I get. So I typed the 5,000 leases and uh, sure and behold, he gave me $5,000 for my efforts and I thought that was wonderful. It's 1948 and it's in the summer and there's a new station in town at 1140 on, on the AM dial, KLPR. And here was a station that I might be able to, to work for. So I went to, I went to the people, the powers to be at KLPR. They, they were in Capitol Hill at South Oklahoma City on uh, Southwest 29th Street where their offices and, and the, the radio part was out uh, on the highway uh, down by Moore, Oklahoma. So I went in and they said, well, we can't pay you anything, but uh, if you want to write copy, uh, and that's writing commercials, uh, we'll give you a job this summer and see how you work out. And if you work out, uh, we'll put you on the payroll in the fall. So I went to, uh, went there every day, rode the streetcar to, uh, to South Oklahoma City, to Capitol Hill, and wrote copy. I had a hundred accounts that I wrote for and bought a lot of magazines on my own. I bought my own lunch. They, they furnished me nothing except a typewriter and some paper. And I got lots of experience, lots of experience. And it was a great radio station. And they had a man uh, that uh, was on in the uh, noon hour and the early part of the afternoon, Grant Ladd and he had quite a following, a real big following, in fact. And 
it's ironic because in later years, I turned out to hire a grant lad. But in the meantime, I had been doing a bit of skullduggery because I found out there was an FM radio station that the Oklahoma City School Systems owned, which was KOKHFM. So I went up there and I just fell in love with the surroundings, especially the fact that they were also daytime the uh, uh, programming for uh, KETA TV Channel 13, which is now the OETA. Uh, so we were, I was running the FM station, I ran the camera and did some directing for the uh, Channel 13 programming. And in the meantime, uh, KOKH uh, TV came about from the Board of Education finding out the people wanted to sell the now dark KTVQ, which was Channel 25 and it was located in the Victoria building at 18th and Classing. So this station was uh, shut down and the school board bought it and we came back on the air as an educational station with uh, Channel 25 KOKH uh, TV. And so I was working for two television stations and a radio station uh, for quite a time. And in, uh, in, those, in those days, uh, I, I was able to break my work schedule up to 3.15 in the afternoon because most of the programming uh, was between three and four. So I left uh, the broadcasting center at 18th and Ellison at 315 and dashed out to uh, the transmitter site uh, where uh, KWTV Channel 9 is now. We had a building of our own back there. And we broadcast from four till about nine o'clock in the evening. So I went out there to work those hours and now I was working for <laughs> three daytime jobs and then one evening job. And I learned about the board, uh, uh, you know, wanting to expand everything. And that was when they brought Bob Allen into the picture. And that was the time for me to, uh, to leave and uh, take another job that I had been offered from the First National Bank. Uh, they wanted to build an FM station. Uh, the people at Video Independent Theaters had a permit to build an FM station. And uh, I don't know whether it was Mr. Griffin or somebody like that that was killed in an airplane crash, so they never built the station. So they said, if you will build an FM station, we'll give you the building permit uh, to uh, the First National Bank. So they bought it for a dollar from uh, Video Independent Theaters. Uh, it was quite an experience uh, because I had also been working for Video Independent Theaters, programming their radio station in Tulsa. They had a they had a radio station over there on FM, and I was making the tapes for them uh, at Soundworks in Oklahoma City. And uh, uh, I thought that was interesting that all of that came about. So here we are finally building our own FM station, the first FM stereo station in the state of Oklahoma, 3,300 watts in the First National Bank. It was, in the, it was titled uh, as the First National Foundation, which was in essence a nonprofit uh, area, but you know, it wouldn't have hurt to make some money too. Um, our station did, did quite well. We had a, a wonderful following. We had a first class radio station. 
and I was the manager of it, and what a pleasure it was to offer Oklahoma City such wonderful entertainment. So, uh, in, that was in 1962, and, and March uh, 16th, 1962, when we went on the air with, uh, with the first stereo station, KFNB-FM. So then, uh, two years later, in 1964, uh, we applied for a permit to have 100,000 watts. They were now authorizing 100,000 watt stations uh, with our frequency of 101.9. So we built a new radio station with 100,000 watts. And in the process, they also allowed you to have vertical and horizontal uh, polarization, as they called it. So we, we ran 100,000 watts vertical and 100,000 watts horizontal. We had two 20 kilowatt uh, Collins transmitters. They were brand new, state of the art. And uh, it was quite interesting. We had a beautiful, beautiful sound uh, out of those great transmitters and that good coverage. Um, as this station was, was built, I, I must say I have to digress for just a moment by saying in 1963, a friend of mine, George Kravis in Tulsa, decided he wanted to build an FM station. And he was a friend of mine when we were all at the Class and Broadcasting Center. So I went over, I left uh, KFNB for about nine months or 12 months and went over and built uh, the first 20,000 watt FM station KRAV in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then I came back to uh, our station over here at KFNB in 64, and that's when we built the, the 100,000 watts. So that brings me up to date on that subject. Some of the people that that were involved in the radio station as well as several uh, that came through and were interviewed for programs on the station. Um, I mentioned La uh, Grant Ladd uh, being a person of interest uh, uh, from KLPR days of 1948. Uh, he applied for a job with me in uh, 1962 and I was lucky enough to get him. He's, he had a wonderful voice and people knew who he were, uh, who he was, I'm sorry. And um, uh, so I had Grant Ladd. We, we reconnected after all of those years uh, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. But let me say, uh, Virgil Sprankle uh, was uh, the building manager of the radio station, I mean, of the, uh, of the building, but he was also uh, the president of the uh, corporation for the radio station. Then we had Clarence Deal, who had been the uh, chief engineer for uh, KOKH-FM and uh, the television station. So we had those two folks and myself, the three of us, put the station together. Some of the people that worked with us were Terry McGrew uh, from WKY, uh, Tom McCoy. Tom McCoy came from several radio stations, including KYFM, which was a competitor uh, some uh, years prior to that. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, of course, Grant Ladd and many others that came along. Uh, now let's talk for just a moment about some of the exciting things that came through the door with us. Uh, almost always when there was some kind of a function, uh, uh, we would interview people like uh, uh, Arthur Fiedler from the Boston Pops was in our studio for an interview. Uh, I interviewed uh, Wanda Jackson. She also came out to my house on Classen and recorded on my <laughs> kind of broken down uh, 
uh, recording machine to make a test uh, to send to somebody to try to get a recording contract. Uh, also, Ginger Rogers came through and uh, was interviewed by Ted Ebright, another one of our stars of, uh, of people at uh, KFNV. Let me see if I can think of some others. Uh, we had Barbara Streisand's sister, Rosalind Kind, uh, that came by. I interviewed John Denver, uh, and he autographed an album for me. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Don Knotts. Uh, I interviewed Don Knotts uh, in the press club. He was quite, a, quite an interesting person to be around, uh, as well as Harv Presnell from Paint Your Wagon. We recorded him over in the, in the basement uh, uh, restaurant at the Skirvin Hotel. One of the surprises that I had at KFNB one afternoon was these three ladies walked in and they were promoting their new movie and it was showing at the Tower Theater. I'm sorry, I can't remember uh, the name of the movie. I remember that one of the girls was, was Tippi Hedren. Uh, and I cannot remember the other two ladies, but they were quite bosomy, uh, and you may perhaps get to see a picture of them at some point. Uh, but throughout the years that uh, I was at KFNB, uh, we had very, very many interesting people that came by, people from the symphony. We, uh, we were a good station. We played classical music, we played popular music, uh, folk music. Our programming was uh, uh, was set up to to play a lot of things and a lot of different kinds of things. So the format uh, in the evening had a full hour of classics, and we on Friday night we used to broadcast live from uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was uh, it was folk music and it was live. Uh, it was up on. Uh, Seems like to me it was up on Walker. Anyway, uh, this diversion has uh, brought me to the, to the point that we decided to take KFNV and make it a classical music station. At, uh, we called it uh, 101 uh, Stereo at that time. And we played classical music and semi-classics and light popular music. And we had a program guide which I put out each month that, that showed any kind of classical music that we had. We had a morning program uh, from uh, 10 to noon and then we had a, a noonday concert. Uh, we had an afternoon and an evening concert and in between we would play uh, light popular music. Something like beautiful music that would fit nicely uh, with classics. So it was quite interesting to, uh, to send this program guide out. They, uh, our listeners would write in and we'd add them to our list. And uh, uh, we had quite a nice list, several thousand people that uh, asked for the guide. Uh, it did not make us any money. And eventually uh, uh, we had to drop the classics. And at that time we went to a beautiful music format uh, which was programmed out of uh, uh, the Hancock Center in Chicago called Today's Beautiful Music. Well, Today's Beautiful Music put us on the map. We only had one competitor, and that was KKNG. They were doing the very same thing we were, but two of us were fierce competitors of each other. And uh, we did quite well, and they did quite well. Uh, with, uh, with today's beautiful music, uh, we made a name for ourselves. And at that point, uh, uh, the sales were not what they should be, so uh, the foundation which we were under decided to sell the radio station. And the person that purchased it was Clint Murkison, who owned the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, so he bought the station for, and it had to be cash, it couldn't be anything else. They had to deliver cash by wire. 
And they did that. And out of that transaction, Ken Dow and his family came to Oklahoma City to change the call letters from KFNB to KLTE. K -L -T -E, and we changed it to KI, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how it was, it was but it was KLight. And that's what everybody remembered. We were, we were the light. And uh, we had a wonderful radio station. We had fun things on. Uh, we had uh, funny little jokes things in the mornings on our morning program. We had our own airplane that we did traffic with. Uh, we had uh, Randy Kemp was in the airplane uh, every morning and we had uh, Pam Finn, who had a very nice uh, uh, afternoon program. She was one of our highlight people for, for the ladies in that area. We had two or three ladies work for us as announcers, plus uh, 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 a guy by the name of Williams. Can't remember his first name, but he was quite talented, fun, and Ray Ackerman, Jr., uh, did a lot of funny things, including his uh, imitation of uh, Julia Child. Uh, that was very, very good. I should take time to mention Ken Dow and his family coming to town to, uh, to run the radio station and direct the uh, programming into such marvelous things that, that this man could do. He's internationally famous uh, for uh, pulling radio stations out of the red into the black and making lots of money, uh, including our station. We did quite well, sales were good, uh, and Ken was very much fun to work for. He's, uh, he's a talented man. He's the kind of a guy that's an innovator uh, in all aspects. He just, uh, he was a fun person to work with, let me tell you. And his family was wonderful too. Uh, his, uh, his wife's name was Dottie, and Dottie was our bookkeeper. Uh, so she came to work every day to, to uh, work on the books and uh, also help on a, a new type of computer that we had. It was on a great big 16 inch disc and it, uh, it wasn't very good and it finally crashed and and uh, we had quite a time reconstructing everything to, to run it manually until we got something else to take its place. So anyway, we, uh, we uh, trudge along with uh, good programming and good money and everybody was paid well. And uh, uh, Clint Murkison uh, became ill, uh, even though Clint Murkison never set foot at uh, K-Light Radio, not even once did he ever come up. He just bought it and gave it to Ken to run. So uh, Ken sold the radio station uh, uh, very quietly. I was the only person that knew uh, that the station was for sale. The rest of them were guessing that it might be, but uh, they didn't know for sure, but I knew it was being sold. So it was sold, and I don't know who, who the name of the people were, but it was changed to Cool Radio. And after Cool came along, uh, I guess I gave a, a cool leave because uh, I left and Ken Dow left Oklahoma City. But during this period of time that Ken was here and uh, uh, some years before, uh, Soundworks, uh, did a lot of uh, a business with uh, all of the notable people around town. Um, I could turn 300 commercials uh, on tape to an agency overnight and nobody in town could do that. So I became the, uh, the uh, dub king of Oklahoma City. And I worked for Ackerman, I worked for Low Runkle, uh, Ross Cummings and uh, many, many other uh, good agencies. And uh, also for uh, Glenn Bozell Jacobs. Uh, they owned the, uh, uh, the uh, contract with the bank 
uh, through the years and did their advertising for them. So even prior to, uh, to those days when uh, I was associated with many people uh, there in the building uh, with John Spence who was one of their uh, one of their producers and writers and uh, he uh, turned out fabulous commercials and I did his audio work for him and he put those together at WKY TV uh, which was uh, quite unique because in those days it was difficult to uh, transition from one scene to another and John had a way to do it that made it look beautiful. Did a beautiful job. So now we're out of um, we're out of Cool, which I really uh, only did one little project for them. But I do want to mention some of the radio stations uh, uh, that may not have uh, come to mind. KWHP was a station uh, in Edmond, Oklahoma, and Bill Payne owned that. He uh, did a nice job and uh, eventually sold the station. There was uh, a station called uh, KAFG uh, that later became KJOY or KJYO. Uh, it's, uh, it's been around a long time in a lot of different formats. There was KYFM. I don't know what it became. Uh, but Tom McCoy worked for them and, they, and he also worked for me. Uh, and in mentioning Tom McCoy working for KFNB, and I forgot to, to mention this, uh, he later became one of the uh, FCC uh, people in Washington. He worked for the uh, Federal Communications Commission. I thought that was quite nice and uh, a very talented person at that. This section of our talk is on uh, uh, Soundworks Corner Incorporated. Actually, this came about in a couple of ways, but let me digress just a little bit to show you how Soundworks evolved. From 1957 up to uh, the present, even now, uh, Soundworks has operated as, a, as an independent studio, uh, and my first recording machine I bought at Trice Wholesale and borrowed the money for it at uh, the uh, credit union uh, when I was at uh, the Class and Broadcasting Center. I recorded percussion concerts. I recorded many people uh, uh, in uh, political situations. Um, I, I did a lot of recording over at the uh, First Presbyterian Church. Uh, I built my studio in the uh, building behind where I live at 4905 North Class and Boulevard. Uh, and we have a, a studio where we have about four people. So it's, it's called a voiceover studio. It's not a studio that you record bands or anything like that. So it's quite interesting uh, to see how I had almost every notable person in town come through. I had, I had uh, uh, David Boren recorded in the studio, uh, George Nye. Uh, many people from the political areas, uh, uh, gee, I just couldn't name them all, hundreds of them probably, uh, as well as uh, uh, working for agencies, doing commercials. I was really, I'd like to talk just a minute about my parents. Uh, I had their backing and their love and everything that went with, uh, with anybody that wanted to really succeed in business and I did have to try, if that's not the rest of the sentence, so. Uh, as my mother had passed away, my dad was uh, on his last few moments. Uh, I did get to see him, and I'd gotten a call from Virginia Dunaway at the Low Runkle Company. Uh, they had been away from me for a period of time where I wasn't getting their business. And she called and she said, would you like to have our account back? And I said, oh, yes, I would. So I went to tell my dad and I told my dad, don't worry about me. 
because I'm going to make it. I've got the Rockle account again. I just got it today and I'm getting ready to start to work for them tomorrow. So you don't have to worry about me not having enough of anything. Uh, so I'm set and my business will be good from then on. And of course it was. It just kept growing and growing and growing. Uh, I did quite well. I, I'll not mention figures, but I did quite well for an independent studio. And then the process of uh, kind of winding down with some of the things I was doing, uh, I had an opportunity to meet a lady. I was getting my hair cut by Becky uh, Billings, who had been cutting my hair for about 25 years, or I don't know, 20 years. It's a long time. And she uh, gave me the name of a, of a woman who uh, lived in Oak Tree. She didn't know whether she lived in Oak Tree or Smoke Tree. She was just a fabulous, fabulous, fun person. I met her over lunch. I took her to uh, the 501 Cafe. And we had a tuna, a yellow tuna sandwich. And I took her back home and it was dates, dates, dates. We, it, we were actually just inseparable from the moment we first met each other. And I knew that this woman, Betty Ray, was soon gonna be Betty Ray Corner. And she was. Eight months later, we got married. And uh, I took her on a windjammer cruise for our honeymoon. And we went to the, uh, to the Caribbean and a windjammer cruise is where you don't wear shoes, you wear cutoffs, and uh, the ladies wear uh, a little something, but not too much, and the men uh, don't have to have a shirt on, they can just have their shorts. And we had such a good time. We, we jumped in the water, we played in the, played in the sand, and we had beach parties, and we sailed at night and slept on top, of the, on top of the deck during the night so that we could count the stars. And it was just very, very romantic. And I, my love is Betty. I love her. And I hope you have an opportunity to meet her.